Hello and welcome back. If you saw part one, you know that I'm trying to get my HP 5233 counter back up and running again. The instrument is an interesting hybrid of old vacuum tube technology along with the black magic of early discrete component digital logic circuits. Now I started with a 25 step restoration plan, but I went a little overboard on the second step, reviewing the schematic, as I took the opportunity to prototype out some of the more key circuits in the system. Starting with the multi-vibrator, then the Schmidt trigger, a single flip-flop circuit was next, and then I got all three to work together. Next I made a 4-bit digital counting circuit. On the high voltage bench I managed to get a sort of working prototype of how the low voltage signal from the counter is passed over to a brace of high voltage neon bulbs which in turn control which digit of the mixie tube is displayed. Next I created an animation of how the neon bulbs control the display of the mixie tubes. In the end I did manage to get up to step number 7 pulling all the cards and recording where they were removed. So picking it up where I left off, I think I was just about ready to say some prophetic words. It's discrete component pornography. It's just... <laughs> so now that the cards are out and neatly put away over in the other temporary bench with their own little index cards for each one. I can take a closer look at the chassis and see if there's any problems going on with this. And the uh, first thing I noticed was over here. I'll zoom in and you can see it here. It's a resistor hanging in outer space. Didn't move that at all. That's just sitting there. That is a problem because I have no idea what it connects to. And there is no... Uh, what is that? It's a... Uh, 600 and 6700 or 6900 ohm and there is no 6900 ohm resistor in the system so I don't know why that's there. You're going to have to be very careful. The other quickie thing I did when I was taking things out uh, was I made sure the, the places that weren't numbered uh, got numbered so I know where to put them back in. So I couldn't find that 6900 ohm anywhere on a schematic. The, the other point is I couldn't exactly find all the resistors that were indicated on the schematic that were supposed to be on the switch. So I eventually had to take it off. It was a rather laborious operation I had to be very careful. I managed to identify all the resistors on the switch except for one 820 ohm job which I just could not find as it was buried in the bottom of the switch. In the end I couldn't get a good look at the bottom side of the switch without disconnecting all the wires. So I had to make use of my trusty little inspection camera to get a good look on the inside. Well, not that good. So, I was nugging around in there. <laughs> and if you look ever so carefully at my <laughs> screen. Right. Yeah. I had it a second ago. There. Right there. I can barely make it out. <laughs> but, eight two zero eight hundred and twenty so the 820 is there I'm not gonna worry about it then so that other one that was just stuck somewhere someplace else was just somebody playing silly beggar somewhere anyway the first thing I'm gonna do is put it back to stock so I'll take that out of there for now it's definitely just yeah pops right off so someone's tack on job as I had the switches all taken apart, I took the opportunity to give them all a good wash and deox it. And uh, I did the other side of the switches as well, and then of course I just put the switches back together. I simply continued on examining the chassis after this, and I didn't find any other damage or leaking caps. And then it was on to the next little thing I had to do. First thing you want to check is the transformer to make sure it's still okay. And of course we do that via the schematic, just reading off of this and the red wires. So it, of course it says black and black red. So there's the black red there, and the black one goes to there. So that side of the winding is good. I'll find out where the other side of the windings are, which I think are green and green, and hook that up. So we don't want it, it thing that should be going to red, so we don't want continuity with any of the red ones and any of the green ones. Good. So it's not 
cross wired. Of course, we do want continuity. Hmm, that's odd. I'm not getting a beep. Ah, there it is, yeah. There's the red one over here. Red. And I should get the same peep. Good. And the green ones. Good. Well, there's only two to check on green. So, the transformer is good. That's test number one. Also looking down here, there's no goop coming out of the trans the uh, capacitors at all, so that's all good. The next thing to do is to walk, look through the circuit closely, looking for any loose wires or anything. Ugh. Taking any large dust bunnies out we find, or any other bugs, like we found that first one, and making sure everything's up, hooked up connect correctly. So I didn't find anything bad on the chassis anywhere, so all I did next was get things set up to reformat the big can caps on my chassis. I did have to move back to the high voltage bench again in order to use my heat kit 117 power supply again. Anyway, looks like I'm mostly through oming out and taking all those little bits off, so let's see what I'm up to. Okay, so we're all set up here. I've got my nice big milliampere, old fashioned milliampere analog one. Goes up to 100 milliamps, which I really doubt I'm going to use, but it's always when you're doing these old analog uh, meters, you always start with the highest and work the way down. We've got the voltage off, the voltage monitored there. I don't trust the one in the old, so we'll throw the voltage on. And 9, 8, 7, so it's starting at 10 volts. We're getting no movement on the meter. We'll put it up to 20. Nothing on the meter, so that means I can move my meter down. That's actually a good sign, meaning the current is trickling in very slowly. So we'll put the voltage back down to zero. Whoa, it's discharging. So it was charging. We'll discharge that cap. Voltage, turn the voltage back on, We're back up to 10 volts, move it to 20, a little meter movement, so that's actually a good thing, so we'll put it back down, we'll go on the lowest scale, which is micro amps, and we'll start increasing the voltage, 10, oh, that's a meter moving, whoa, one milliamp, one micro amp, so that cap is pretty good. So, all we do now is we'll put it to 25 volts, which is one third rating. Note that, that at 25 volts we got uh, 2 millivolts. So that means that counts you for me. And guess what? We let it sit there for a while, about 5 or 10 minutes to see if it goes down. And then we increase the voltage a little more. So we're back after half an hour and it actually has dropped down to less than one U amp. So we'll ramp her up again. This time up to 50 volts. Whoop. Uh. There we go. 50 volts, and we're reading about 5 milliamps, so that's actually really good. Oh, well, come back in another half hour. Uh, okay, back again. Still charging up slowly, but still down at 2.5. Let's raise that up to a full 75 volts.
Alright, so... Very good so far. Oh, well, let that sit for a nice long time now. It's been a good hour or so and it's gone down to about uh, 7 milliamps, what, microamps? And it's drawing 53 volts out of 75, so that actually should be pretty nice. I think that one's all reformed. I'm going to let it run for another few more minutes and see if it comes down any more. And that'll be it. Then I'll have to do the other ones. It's going to take a while. So while the big caps are busily reforming, I set myself to the job of reviewing all the circuit boards for any damages, check the values of as many components as I could manage, and really just admire visually those beautiful discrete component circuits. And of course, I'm going to start off at the most logical point, A1, the power supply assembly, which has on it the bridge rectifiers for all the incoming voltages from the transformers, a positive 20 volt regulator, and a negative 15 volt regulator. So you might ask why I use these little index cards. The question is, it's really easy to lose something. And this system, which I sort of seen before when I was working in the military years ago, not as a maintainer, just sort of being in the shop, the guys would do this system. And basically, you'd have a, an index card for each component you're taking out, and you could write notes on it and tell what you're doing, what you might need as well. Anyone else who comes by can see which note's gone by, which card has gone by, which card is out of place or not in the, the workbench. We used to have little tags as well, so you'd actually have to go into the system, get the tag, pull the tag out, so everybody knows where everything is at any one time, especially with critical systems. Anyway, so I'm just going to review this one. This is the power support by board itself, and I'm just going to have a quick look at that. There's a little, a little uh, damage down there. Definitely some heat damage. Things are heating up on this over time. But you can see they actually did a lot of high quality. It needs a good cleaning all over. Of course, I've marked it there. Uh, it needs good cleaning. The other thing I do is I will mark down where, what caps are on here. Caps, there's our 247s. And I think that's a 10. According to the power supply, that's about it. Again, this is the uh, controlling power supply. So this one, what I'm going to do now is do a quick run through the diodes. I don't have to go through each one. I'm probably all okay. Okay, so I was uh, beginning to clean this up. The old scraper here, getting rid of the solder paste and crap that's around. But you know, looking at all the other cards and then this one, and where the... I'll zoom in a bit here. And where all the uh, leftover flux is, you don't see any leftover flux in any of the other cards. But here you see the flux, leftover flux, wherever there's a capacitor. So I'm beginning to think, here, 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 that this thing has been recapped at one time. Oh well. Anyway, so I've got my caps list down here, what to get. And I'm not going to bother cleaning it anymore, because it probably looks like I'm going to have to recap it anyway. If it's been recapped once, I'll probably have to do it again. But we'll see. I did check all the uh, resistors, they're all within tolerance, which is good, at least I can tell. So on to the next card. On to our next card, of course the differential amplifier. Uh, there's really only one cap on this that's interesting, and that's this one over here, and it's actually a whip tantalum. Now, 6.8 UF, probably because they need a very small size, and the only way to get that in those days with a high E thing was wet tantalum. I do happen to have some that can replace it. And again, this one looks like it's been, uh, zoom in. mangled up nicely too. Someone's re-soldered or re-tried uh, to tin it for whatever reason. I don't know why. Oops, sorry. Yeah, someone's tried to re-tin it very badly. Lots of solder crap on it. 
I'm probably gonna have to clean all that off. Probably because it, was, it looks like it might have been loose because it was really in there tight. So they, they were thinking it would probably that. Uh, anyway, that was the differential amp, and as you can see, big difference in that op amp. <laughs> After all the years. Of course, it's just a single long tail pair. So, uh, I'll have to test that amp. The thing about tantalums is they either are good or bad. They're either open or bad. Yeah, so it comes up 6.42, so that one's actually good. All right, good, now go to the next diff. The uh, more astute of you out there would have noticed that I skipped over a2, 3, and 4. Well, A2 I didn't actually take apart, as there's nothing in there but a few neon bulbs. And A3 and 4 are the attenuators, and they're just really too hard to take apart because they're mingled in with the switches. But I did have a close look at them when I was taking the switch apart, and everything looked okay in there. Of course, next on my list is A6, and that's just basically a copy of A5. Zoom on that, zoom out a little more. But if you can see right there, the trace has been damaged. So whoever was working on this before probably put their gritty hands across it and ruined that. So I'll have to go ahead and check that later to make sure that trace is okay. That looks all right. Anyway, I might clean that up as well. So I'll make a note of that. And now I gotta check that tantalum on there. Now the next one is A7, the trigger amplifier assembly, which is made up, I think, of three parts. There's the uh, gate flip-flop that comes in here, which takes the signal coming from the differential amplifier and flips and flops it. And then there is an amplifier for that made up of these two, which I think is just a long-tailed pair, voltage follower. And then finally, this little amplifier here, which is the marker amplifier, which amplifies the actual point when it tells it to flop or flip. Um, the only problem I had with these ones was that the, uh, like the other ones, they had a lot of extra solder down at the bottom here, and I had to clean it off. Everything else was okay about the card. And the other thing to notice with these, oops, with these cards, uh, is you notice here, they have little ferrite beads on some of the capacitors and very highly selected capacitors and that's because uh, the flip-flops are fairly unstable like you saw on the breadboard so they really really select their parts to make a very stable system anyway the A8 is next and that's basically exactly the same when I encountered the same problem I had to clean off some solder that was down there and uh, everything else is okay about the board, so uh, we can go on to the next one. Next is our uh, time base, which of course only has two parts on it. The uh, Schmidt trigger, which is over here. And uh, the uh, oscillator circuitry, which is over here. Uh, there is one electrical cap on there, and I've put it down there. You have to check that one later. Uh, the real oddball thing, of course, is the selection of parts. The <laughs> huge, big... 0.1 megafarad cap and then the domino cap down over here Not sure why they picked the domino cap there on the oscillator circuit, but Must be because they want it very very uh, Precise or just gave something to keep the oscillator very balanced You also notice like on some of the other boards ferret beads on a lot of the caps and The most odd thing is I thought when I first looked at this that these two caps uh, C4, for example, uh, with one uh, UF, which I thought was an odd value for a ceramic cap. And I thought that the uh, schematic might be a problem, so I went out and checked the parts list, and it was okay on the parts list. And then eventually I bent over and had a good look with the loop. And if you look very carefully, you can see that it says 1.0M on these guys. Let me try to zoom in here. Yeah, it says 1.M, so the R1 UF, they must have been pretty rare in those days. Anyway, anything other interesting is these hand-wound uh, coils, everything else is okay. So we'll go over to the next one now. Okay, here we are at the, the uh, decade divider assembly. 
And again, this is just two, uh, four flip-flops. One, two, three, four. So a binary circuit, simple binary circuit. Again, the only thing to watch out for is these things down here. Yeah, these things down here, which are diodes, not resistors. Uh, the card is nice and clean. I couldn't find, I had a good, good close look at it. I couldn't find any rework on it. So this area down here looks like it's been getting old. We'll have to check it. Let's see if it transistor. So they might have popped out a transistor at one time in there. Maybe. The, uh, let's see, no, that's about it. it. Simple thing, they really, just a simple uh, flip flop. Next are six more decade dividers. Now I'm not going to review each of these as they're all identical and the only difference between these six and the last one is that these six are built to a little less tolerance than the first one. As all of them are built to a frequency standard I think of less than one mega cycle. And as a bonus they're all interchangeable so it makes debugging easier. Anyway on to the next. Now back down to the time based driver. Again this is a really simple card not much on this one but it's pretty varied. We have the a one-shot multi-vibrator here uh, that controls the time base. Uh, again, you see those ferrite beads and really, really tight tolerances. Again, we have that one microfarad uh, funny-looking cap, which is really an odd one to see in these things, but they all look okay. And the other thing we have on this is the printer hold-off amplifier over here, and that uh, holds the system off until the printer is finished printing and uh, this is about the time that HP started integrating all sorts of printer functions and databases systems and the last little bit is this little bunch of resistors here which is a voltage divider that's used somewhere we're off on another board the board's in fine shape I don't think it's gonna be any problem with this one so on to the next one good old number 18 my absolute favorite board on the whole system mainly because it has such a great function it's the main gate slash decimal counter driver assembly and uh, one shot multi vibrator here and then over here you have the neon bulbs for the decimal display and they have absolutely nothing to do with this circuitry it's just that they're all on the same card for space saving but the actual most important part if I zoom in a little there's a little, little diode down here diode resistor combination that's actually the main gate without that the whole system wouldn't work <laughs> well lots of other things won't work but again Without that, nothing's going to work. Uh, card looks fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Again, those ferrite beads there and a uh, one farad uh, ceramic capacitor for the timing on the multivibrator. And we'll go on to the next one. So next we actually have one of our decimal counters. There we go. Ugh. And this is where all the magic happens. Of course, we have our one, two, three, four flip-flops, which represent the four bits, which count out as four, two, and two, and one. We also have 170, 170 volts on this board. So you have to be careful with this one. That's the 170 volts that go in that dries the Nixie tubes. Of course, this container here is the one that's got the light bulbs in it. Now, I've been warned not to take this off because it really can screw up the photo uh, resistors that are inside there. There's actually not much to see. The only other interesting thing on this one is that it was tested in March of 1966, so it has a date code on it. I don't think this thing's ever been opened. The only reason to open one of these things up is if one of the uh, neon bulbs inside has gone out, but they never go out. So, this particular is the first card and it has a little different arrangement of diodes for some reason probably because it's faster switching uh, than the other 10. I'll get another one and I'll show you what the next one looks like. There you go. So there's another counter again one two three four bits and diodes all over the place. Uh, as you can see this one uses a different set of diodes probably because it's slower switching than the first one. Uh, that's basically it. Again, never take it apart and make sure you mount, count it. Any one of the, uh, the last decimal counters can be swapped out for another one. Can't swap the first one out though. Now to the next two. Here we have A25, another interesting card. Uh, the uh, gate control assembly. Of course we have the typical flip-flop for controlling the gate. These two 
transistors are the flip-flop control uh, down over here uh, at Q5 which is that one that one controls the uh, gate light amplifier circuit which are these two uh, neon bulbs here somehow they're light coupled and work with each other I'm gonna have to ask the guys to the radio club how these actually work uh, next we have this Q3 here which is the uh, gate amplifier which amplifies whatever signals coming in into the gate so it puts it on off and on and then finally Q4 which is this one here which is the inhibit amplifier coming in from the uh, other systems to turn the gate off and on when there's a time to stop so that's how that one works uh, again everything looks okay in this thing it's uh, no damage that I can see and uh, no electrolytics or anything to take a closer look at on to the next one now we're at the uh, last card in the system which is the uh, transfer and sample rate uh, board um, over here we have the transfer multivibrator that transfers the values around and right next to it we got the sample rate multivibrator I think this is meant sample rate yeah sample rate multivibrator right next to each other uh, this one over here Q6 is a recovery amplifier that pulls back uh, any data it's not data that's lost but recovers the last reading and uh, I think the a transfer amplifier that transfers the data from the multivibrator up into the decimal array and finally CR7 which is reset amplifier uh, this one of course has two electrolytics and a tantalum I'll have to check all those on these ones might have to pull them might have to reform them anyway everything looks okay on that card the, this diode here looks a little cracked but they all sort of had that that sort of look on them. Anyway, that's it for the cards. As it turns out, that wasn't it for the cards. As my high voltage bench was already set up for reforming caps, and I still had one of the big caps to go through, I took the opportunity to lift one lead of each of the electrolytic caps on the cards so I could test their capacitance on a circuit, and if required, give each a quick reformat. Unfortunately, all the electrolytic caps tested high, and they were all out of tolerance. I even discovered this on the A1 power supply assembly. And what I discovered was this one here was 47 microfarads. So obviously whoever mucked with this before didn't have the correct capacitor to put back in. And of course I don't have a 10 UF actual capacitor hanging around in my inventory. As it turns out all I did have in my inventory were the unobtainium wet tantalum caps. All of which of course tested fine. So in for a penny in for a pound. I decided I might as well replace all the electrolytic capacitors on the boards. As I have to wait for my cap order to come in, I decided I might as well try this. I can do my first running test, which is trying to figure out how to test for at least the voltages on these caps. Now you saw that I reformed them. Hopefully they reformed well. And you can't actually do anything from this side of the board unless you want to stick your connectors down in here. But we'll stay away from there from now. And we'll actually flip her over. Oop! and do our testing on this side with this line of controls over here so as I said in my got from my list from before it's a slow power up to see what the power coming out of it's like uh, with the with the dim bulb and the variac uh, and let it sit there for a little while at that level now before I get started it's a quick word about this the plug these damn older HP ones had these really obscure plugs. They're hard as hen teeth to find and sometimes cost more than the instrument. Yeah, okay, so we're all set up to go. There's the voltmeter right there. I've got the dim bulb tester plugged in with one amp worth of bulbs, or half an amp actually. I've got it running and I've got it set to 50 volts. So let's throw the switch here. Oop, the fan is kind of moving. So I'm just getting some sort of current draw. We'll check pin number seven. 50 volts. Okay. And then pin number nine. 56.5. In the end, it proved to be a successful power up. I managed to get it to full line voltage with the dim bulb 
current limiter and then again without the dim bulb current limiter and I didn't release any magic smoke. So I think this is a good time to end this video and I'll let Gunny take us out while I'm busily taking voltage readings as I slowly increase the line voltage with the Variac.